Okay, so I wanted to just rush through everything, give everyone some time. Um, hopefully I'm not like, uh, I'm not going to be like rushing over them too quick. Hopefully there's some common lesson that unifies all these submissions today. Um, there's going to be a little bit of talk on composition, so I see two images where we need some composition fixing, this one and this one. Um, a little bit work, a little bit on palette work for this one, beautiful image. And uh, a little bit on sculpting and form here. And beautiful, by the way, pose, absolutely gorgeous. I love the tilt in his head. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just going to start with this one. For this one, it's some, just about the cleavage and the, and the bone area. Uh, the, the main issue with this is that you've pretty much just forfeited any anatomy. There's like almost no representation of bones and muscle here. It's just like a symbol. It's like a symbol of a collarbone, and uh, or the silhouette of the uh, of the shoulders and the neckline. There is no thought about bones and uh, muscle, which is not good. And the reason why there is no thought about bones or muscles is because there is no inherent knowledge on the subject. It means that you yourself, as the artist, have not considered this part yet. So, the question is, why did you attempt to draw something you haven't even researched yet? You've just depended on whatever your mind has managed to memorize over the years, which isn't much. Um, the mind doesn't spend time on particulars, so what you have to do is make your mind spend time on particulars, force it to, make it study a particular subject or two, so that you, uh, that you, you know, you represent it better when you redraw it. So what I'm trying to do here is create some basic symmetry first and foremost. Symmetry is important in anatomy, and, uh, human anatomy, any anatomy, and, um, I'm going to try to bring in some muscle structure mixed in with some bone structure. So the muscles here can be a little bit outward. And we've got the neckline that needs to be a little bit less long connected to the jawline. She's very skinny, so I would suspect her face to be a little bit more close to the neckline, less fat on it. Okay. And then we've got the silhouette taken care of, so before, after, a little more symmetry, a little more read. Next up is the, uh, the throat and its connection to oopsie, the collarbones. For collarbones, they're very easy. You just have to decide which, which direction the light source is coming from, of course, and then respond by illuminating those areas. better brush strokes in. Okay. And then connecting that throat piece down. And then beneath these highlights of the collarbone, of course, is the shadow area of the collarbone. And the collarbone area usually merges back. I'm not going to be able to render this perfectly. This is pretty much the basic of it. Try to throw the shadow in of the collarbone structure as well as the highlight area if the light allows it to be seen. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to just sneak it in there. Um, the whole gesture itself is very, very stiff. So as a general diagnosis for where you are in your art right now, Mr. Artist, um, is the fact that you need to start organizing your approach, your study approach. You need to look up some references and you need to create a, an, an, a safe learning environment for anatomy and that gesture drawing and, and form studies and figure drawing all work together to help you create, recreate a human body better. So do some uh, life drawing, figure drawing, uh, gesture drawings, something that will make this less stiff. So I'm just trying to combine the shades here. Next thing is the space between the breasts. It is way too dark and again this is all symbolic. This is you depending on the symbolic. And uh, if you really render and sculpt you realize you need very little brush strokes to have something read. The less brush strokes you need the more proficient of an artist you are because you use less brush strokes to create something that reads better. So by throwing in a couple of brush strokes here and there we create cleavage kind of that reads a little bit better than before. Sorry about the soft brush, it does work fast for me, so I have to depend on it for these critiques. 
to zoom out and choose a high point. So where's the light coming from? If it's coming from her face area, and just throw the high point color on that and it just gets higher and higher in the breast area until it slowly blends in. And then you've got, again, what we set up earlier is the space between the breasts. <clears throat> so the breasts don't just crash together like you would think they would because of, I don't know what reference that has embedded that thought in your mind, but that's not really what they do. They kind of just uh, need to be sculpted. Again, I'm sorry, I don't have time. I have to do this really fast and really rough. <clears throat> I'm just trying to make a, a readable kind of chest area here. Got a couple of shades and excess climbs in the in the in the in your contrast here and there. This means that you don't think about the grayscale. If you thought about it in the grayscale level, um, you would not make these sudden jumps in the contrast because you're using blacks and using no man's lands and you're using way too much contrast for skin. Skin is not capable of this unless you actually paint the neck black. It isn't capable of this level. So, um, so pretty much what you need to be doing is lightening everything up to this level and the grayscale level. Remember beneath every color is a grayscale and you have to learn the grayscale as well as the color hue before you attempt to combine. So what you need to do is line all of this up except for the dark spots. The dark spots need to remain dark. But this is a pretty much the start to, to making a better version of this painting is making sure you fix your values, get some references going and uh, and fix up your your contrast. Make sure that uh, your contrast at the grayscale level has been considered. So before, it is without color, but it is a little bit, it reads a little bit better before, after. All right. So I think it was this artist who messaged me on Facebook saying they met another student of mine who submitted their work all the way in Vietnam or something. I don't know who it was, but someone said that they had, they are currently in some country. Oh wait, it was a secret, so I can't talk about it at all. Um, <laughs> but the point of it is that two people who I teach currently, like one of you guys, have met each other. And, um, and that's cool. And one didn't know, the other knew because they saw that I had critiqued one of their works in my, one of my videos. So yes, uh, that's really cool, in my opinion. I don't know, I've, I've, I know so many people. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, I didn't know, I didn't know that I've, I've touched so many souls. Alright, for this one, it's a composition thing. So let's imagine this as the... Um, as the, uh, the canvas, what you want to do is decide what exactly the composition, how the composition is going to be organized, where the POIs are. So there's the rule of thirds, which is a trusted golden ratio. It's an amazing little trick that will get you, will get you places. And you can trust it, and that's that. So this area here, this scope, this radius that everything is moving towards, um, is the POI, would be the POI. I'm not drawing this currently over the painting, I'm just drawing this separate from the painting in the background. This is probably where you want the eye of the, of the, uh, of the dragon to be. So everything has to move around this. Everything is, is one level less detailed than this. And this is what the golden ratio tells us. Also, the golden spiral um, is one of the points of this. And what you want to do is al always try to create an object that sits along these uh, POI signifier, so these crevice, uh, these these corners, these intersections right here, you want it to touch that. So the snout of the dragon should probably be shifted somewhere along this. There should be a gesture line on which the dragon's wing is, is, is captured. The dragon's head should generally be smaller so that we get a little bit more of a, of a camera scope. So if you've ever seen um, camera on wing plane, it's a high spell plane. Images. There we go. I found it. I found it. Where was it? I saw it, and now it's gone. Damn it. I have to go back here. There we go. See this? We kind of get like a really, really close-up zoom of the of the wing, so we definitely need some foreshortening. 
and you just have to pretty much replace the plane right now with the uh, with the with the rider of the plane and give the give the give the dragon um, I mean replace the plane with the dragon and then throw the, the rider of the of the dragon on top and you have to pretty much bring in a, a gesture line so it would be a gesture line that moves in this way and you've got the dragon's wing this way um, as for detail scope the detail should definitely stay within the, the dragon's face um, but then this is closer up so you're gonna be like wait well shouldn't I detail this no you shouldn't keep detail general and scales and all that very very general even to a point where you might be um, blurring this so pretty much what you're supposed to be doing what I recommend you do the actual fix is shrinking this throwing it off to the side trying to balancing it try to try balancing it along a um, uh, golden spiral or something Let me just see if I can just quickly rough one up <clears throat> Oh, this one, I'm going to be here for a long time. All right, and then um, and then keep the gesture line this way. And then throw in another gesture line where the rest of the dragon's body is. If the dragon's body is tilting anywhere else. And then try to make it so that the legs of the man are trying to balance along this body right here. And he's kind of anticipating the frontward rise. So there might be a little bit of an extra little bend in his spine and abandon his head but he's of course has to stay looking forward a little bit wider trying to keep his balance so he doesn't fall that's all I have to suggest about this one it's all composition colors are beautiful direction is beautiful keep going I'd love to see this finish <clears throat> okay so for this one another composition problem this kind of, I feel it like uh, if we were to name it anything in the industry, like any, give it an industry label, it would be like a card illustration. And if you know, like card illustrations need their space for the character to really shine. Um, so you need to give the, the space around the character, uh, give some space around the character so we can have some head space for them. If they are too close to the canvas edge, it will feel very cut off and it will feel very, and it will, it will affect the way you render as well. It will feel very uh, short. It will leave a lot to be desired. There's that. Second thing is um, detail. It seems very, very blurry. Blurry is definitely the thing here. And you're depending on the blur to really translate the form. Blur does not mean form. You cannot get form with blur. Blur means that there is a lack in the edges. So no edge. Form is entirely dependent on the edge, not blending in edges, being able to create an edge. So the difference between basically uh, the fuzzy version of this versus the, versus the sharpened version of this, I guess. Uh, so right now what you have, you're missing lots and lots and lots of edges. Some of these areas are the nose shadow right here. I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm actually not blending these not blending these just yet you need to establish the light spots of the face you need to not blend certain areas the eyelids might get some a little bit of light on them the lower areas of the eyelids as well she's in a spotlight that's coming from above down on her face so it's casting really long shadows um, what else there would be definitely some edges everything seems to have a blurry out border to it so I would bring the background all the way down onto her hair and just give her hair that clean edge instead of having that fuzz surround her all the time even if she's like some sort of spiritual creature you still want the form to read right so this shirt right here give it some edges this area here clean up the edge don't make it so fuzzy I mean I'm using a soft brush but it would still we need this edge right here. We need these edges because they're separating the background from the foreground. Also, if there is a glow behind her, then the general air around her would technically be a little bit more blue. So this gives you a better chance to, to mess with the edges a little bit. So it lets you tint the background color a little bit better so that we have a better distinction between the foreground and the background. So again, over here, same deal. We're just trying to separate units from each other. You bl you're blending too much. You have a blending problem. Okay. Um, as for the face, of course, go in there and start detailing. You have a lot of places where you can throw in some detail. Blurring, write this back to me, guys. Blurring does not equal detail. If you want to destroy the blur problem in your paintings, 
it's a matter of a detail problem. It's a detail thing. So you got to bring in more information. To cancel out the blur, you bring in more information. So now I'm going to blend those hard edges, but I'm not going to blend them away. I'm just going to gently blend at them until they sort of create and sculpt together. And that kind of reads a little bit better than what you had before, which was way, way too fuzzy. And I'll show you in the before and after. Flatten image. Also, you need a general wash happening in your painting. You need to, you need to like uh, choose a color from which all the colors originate. So this this happens when you throw one general color over everything. So what I recommend, since there's a glowy blue light around everything, I'm just going to recommend a blue wash. And then of course we erase away what we don't need. So it's not going to be completely blue like this. We need to erase away. But we need to leave some of it behind because that's the point of the wash. We've unified the palette with one general, general color. All the shadows and all the highlights all have a touch of this color. And that's what's unifying them together. As for the red you chose for her hair, it has to be a blue-based red. So this means that it has to be a little bit closer to purple. So it would be this color purple, this color red, which is a purple. So the best best neighbor be from between red and uh, and blue is purple. So you, even though her hair is red, it's going to read as red, but it's going to be painted as purple because you're trying to unify the palette together. Before it was too orange. An orange does not is not allowing a, a palette. It's not allowing you to unify the palette. So you want that. So this was a color and a uh, composition problem. Um, the uh, the blue of her skin, that kind of beige you're trying to bring in again. She have to you have to filter it through the, the filter. So any beige, any oranges that run through a filter of blue, turn towards purple. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the skin towards a purple purple tone and again I'm just gonna rush this so you can't just throw the filter over top the blue the blue uh, the blue tint without having considered every level every shade of that and then finally the blue that you're choosing for the the glows they have to they have a blue green to them so you're gonna have to make them more of a of a cool than, than a green. You have to keep away from the warms. And then with knowledge of forms and form structures, of course we need secondary light source to reveal some form. So we're going to need to see some of these hairs, some of these areas um, inherit the color, the secondary light source. And that will again unify the palette. But there's a lot of work left to be done. I mean, are you going to throw this to be the, 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 the are you going to make this the, the point of interest, the, the, the really, really high contrast area here? If you do, it's got to be lit up. And this means that you kind of have to have a generally darker <clears throat> kind of stage going on. What is it? Darken. No. No, it's not darken. Um, it's probably multiply. I'll leave it on multiply. So this whole area, even though the light is coming from above, this area would still be darkened. And you, now you're giving your secondary light source a better chance to glow a little bit. And now it has a better glow. The the glows on the on the ribs have a better chance to glow. The areas here have a better chance. And then this this head of hers has, if you think like a photographer, it ha it has its own. Um, it has its own light source that's revealing it. She has her own primary light source that's helping to show off her face. I'm just trying to reveal some values here. I know her face is a bit too contrasted, but for the sake of time. <clears throat> Whoopsie. So you see, you have to like choose how you have to think about which room, what what room she's in. Is it a darker room? Is it a lighter room? Um, if you don't consider all of these, then what you have is a is a non atmosphere. Like you have no atmosphere. It's a non atmosphere painting. And this is what you had before. Non atmosphere. Everything was too blurry. You had the warm versus the cool, and it wasn't working because there was no general wash. 
You also had um, no atmospheric changes, so the fact that you have secondary light sources. Where's the sunlight? Clearly this is in a dark cave. So if there was a primary light source off camera, um, it would be definitely off camera and it would be mostly on her face. We're trying to show off the dark cave. So what we want to do is darken everything so that we're seeing this character light up in the dark. And then she has her own separate light source on her face that's casting really beautiful dark shadows on her eye sockets that are kind of just barely revealing her bone structure. Just like this. And this is what you want to think about atmosphere. When you ever, whenever, and write this back to me, whenever you draw a character in, a, in an environment, the environment comes first. Nothing comes before the environment. The environment is what decides how much of this character we're seeing. So a little bit on the collarbones. Nope. <clears throat> also, um, since she's wearing such loose clothing, you need to have a more organic droop to areas. Basically in the body there is the hard masses and the loose masses. The breasts are some of those loose masses. So if you're not showing off those loose masses, everything's going to look like it's a Barbie doll and it's all made of plastic and nothing is squishy or, or hard compared to each other. Okay? Well now there's more of an environment. And you can keep dressing this up and keep filtering and keep fixing this up. You definitely have a chance to. I would make her background a little bit lighter so we can see her silhouette a little bit better. Just like that. <clears throat> it's a lot of mermaid-like characters today. Just showing off her silhouette just a little bit from behind the shadow. And then darkening up again. And of course, if this was like a musty cave, we would see the remnants of that ca of that light that was cast on her. So let me push this back down to where it was before. <clears throat> let me get soft light and just like bring in that cool bluish kind of so um, spotlight that just falls on her just like this. And I'm going to erase away what I, what of it I don't want. So we still need some of that. And of course the areas on her face. But we still have some of that really pretty spotlight just falling down on her to explain where all that light is coming from. course, more filtering and more cleaning up is required. Something like that. You really have to think about environment before you think about your character. Or else you'll have something that's a little less appealing. That feels a little bit um, less realistic. The more you think about environment, let me boost the contrast. The more you think about environment, the more believable your character will be in that environment. Maybe this level of contrast is nice. <clears throat> and smudge. I'm just going to just continue on her face. I'm trying to fix the bone structure and stuff. You see, it's okay to be messy because it's much easier to clean after you're, you've been messy. Really, really easier to clean. If you want to make her eyes illuminated as you had before, you can now because the kind of it's kind of allowed now in its own magical way. It's kind of explained that her eyes are visible. Okay, they're visible because of their glow. Oh, the glows must be very similar to these element little thingies. Oh, she must be like a spirit, water spirit, and those are her like spirit animals or something. And you have this over here. You see, I'm not even looking at detail. I'm not even thinking about detail. Everything is zoomed out. And I'm just thinking about the best ways I can reveal the form and keep the atmosphere looking beautiful. So this light right here will reveal some part of her background. Um, her dress right here might be transparent a little bit or wet. Um, have you even thought about water drops? You know, she's obviously fallen out of the water. There's very, very little water drops here that are reading more as wrinkles um, than r real water. 
So I definitely recommend uh, figuring that out as well. And then after all of that is done and tidy and neat, then consider zooming in and detailing. But before that, no way, Jose. You cannot zoom in. Not until you've established a beautiful environment, a light environment, a uh, an atmosphere that reads with the character, that helps present the character. It's not a character design sheet. It's not a. It's not a spread. We have an actual. We don't have a gray background. We can just lean on. We have an actual character we need to make exist in this environment. Okay, so it means that there's going to be lots and lots of, of preparation and uh, just thinking about these and uh, planning. Just think about where I want to have some of these skin tones. No, it's too dark. See, I'm always thinking about that original core shadow I throw on the half. I can't lighten this arm. I can't. Maybe I can darken it. <clears throat> and of course, give the hair some gesture. Don't just leave it as a straight line. Give the hair some life, some animation. Uh, give it some, like, real direction. So we've got, like, uh, you know, like, like, she's, she, like her hair is alive and it kind of like a spiritual and when you have these kind of pretty lights when you have these I mean pretty movements you can really take advantage of those lights that are surrounding her and make them kind of capture and almost because hair can be so transparent uh, it can really leave the the palette that it's from and just take those colors and her hair can really take that color if you guys can see I don't know if you can imagine it Maybe if I decrease the opacity you can give the fate the, 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 the image some movement um, that's your choice, of course, if that's where you want to go with it. <clears throat> but that's all I have to suggest for this one. Um, please think about detail, less blur, think about your environment. Um, fix the environment, get that down, and then zoom in. Um, but in your case, you need, to, you need to figure out, the question is here that I get asked a lot, is uh, how do I detail? I don't know how to detail. How do I zoom in? What, what do I paint? Shrink your brush and ask yourself, are there any edges that need to be cleaned up? That's number one about how to detail. Her shirt might be a little transparent, so I'm just throwing in some transparencies. Um, uh, what else? Her shirt might, I mean, uh, there might be edges. There might be detail. You know, there might be like threads. There might be pores. There might be tiny hairs or tiny lashes. Um, there might be all kinds of stuff that, that needs to be detailed if you don't know how to detail. But you definitely have a blur problem and a detail problem. And uh, you don't seem to have it with the thing, but you have it with the face a lot. This means you need to get on that 14-day challenge. You need to challenge yourself and draw something for 14 days, preferably a face, and, uh, and really get that uh, knowledge down on, on basic face structure. The reason why my face is reading is because I trust the 14-day challenge, what it taught me. It taught me about the importance of light spots and dark spots. In this case, in this severe kind of light source situation with the light shining from above, what's going to be visible is only the light spots, the highest points in the altitude of the face. And that's the cheekbones, uh, the nose tip, and the chin. After that, everything is pretty much just... Uh, just uh, flooded in the darkness and on the eyelids of course and a little bit on on nostrils and stuff but that's it <clears throat> and if you want to detail it can go to the secondary light source uh, light spots so that would be the cupid's bow um, the lip corners the lash the actual lashes the eyebrow lights and that's you detailing and then even further is to just actually start drawing in the pupil So the best, the best way really to, to create an atmosphere is to consider it when your brush is largest. What did I just say? Everyone write it back to me. Sometimes cleaning up an edge brings in detail. You see this? I don't have to bring in a new color. I can just clean this edge up. And then I get detail. Of course, always zoom out because sometimes things don't show unless you zoom out. Okie dokie. So, uh, did everyone hear that? <clears throat> Can 
consider the atmosphere when the brush is largest. Yes. All right. So before, bit confusion on the colors. I mean, her her skin and her color right now would be visible in daytime. Okay, but not in a dark room with the background being black. The only source, the only light source wash, the wash of the palette would have to be a blue wash. Also, give her some space, zoom out. There's too much of a zoom in right now. There isn't enough space for us to really appreciate the character. Um, and then after, after you've established that beautiful uh, kind of atmosphere, then zoom in and paint in that pretty rope. Don't waste your time detailing stuff you're just going to have to paint over to fix the atmosphere. Lay down your atmosphere while brush is large and zoomed out before detailing. Good job, Sacranosia. Flick says, I always find it hard to zoom in. Like, I prefer to keep it zoomed out even if I render, if it's a bad habit. It's not a bad habit. It's a good habit. It's a, it's a good habit that is hard to kind of... Um, it's, 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 it's a good habit. I'm going to say it's a good habit. Because zooming out means you're really thinking about the big brush and what the big brush is doing for you. However... You have to appreciate that there is a amount of detail that's needed to be uh, at least in, in the focal point that needs to be there. So you're going to have to shrink your brush, and you can't really have control over a small brush unless it's uh, it's you've zoomed in a little bit. Um, what else? Find it harder to take. I see. Yeah. Um, bye bye. Whoever's leaving. <clears throat> okay. So do we have any questions regarding this uh, this critique? Any questions? <clears throat> Oops. You wanted to ask black Oreo cookie. What did you want to ask? How exactly does the atmosphere decide the character? Um, no, no, it doesn't decide the character. It decides the colors you use on the character because atmosphere means, okay, where's the light source? When you say, what is the atmosphere? You're basically saying, what is the light source? Where's the light source? Um, so when you're questioning where the light source is, you're questioning how dark it is outside. Okay, is it a nighttime scene? Is it a daytime scene? Is it a humid scene? Is it a scene in a cave? It is, a, is it a scene in a pond? Like I'm kind of going to be looking at with this. So, um, so when you're thinking about it at that level, you're basically saying, okay, well, light is controlling this image, which it always is, because light, we can't see anything without light, so it means that all the colors are controlled by how much light there is. So when I say atmosphere controls what you do with the character, I'm saying atmosphere controls the colors you choose and the values you choose, which is massive. Um, there's also diffuse. What kind of environment is, is around here? Is it is it water? Is it a dry environment? Is, is it a desert? Is it a mountain scene? Is it a humid tropical rainforest? This all also affects colors. It's a lot of physics involved, and this is what I mean, sort of. Um... Okay, does that explain your question, Black Oreo Cookie? Um, not really, Kuro, because I, th I think he has the gesture down. If you were to see it as this is the water level and this is the face, he's kind of done something like, like this, where the boobies are floating because... Well, they're, they're boobies, and then the rest of the body is doing something like that, and her arms are kind of just spread out this way. So I feel like this is okay for the for the, for the the gesture. I think it is above the waterline. Um, I think he's at that point where it's like the perfect bit around the, the, the face, so it's kind of looking like a mask. It's kind of awkward, so I, what I do recommend, if I can just jump right into here, um, <clears throat> uh, what I do recommend is bringing the waterline all the way up. Towards the uh, towards the face, just a little bit, so it feels like she's somewhat still in the water when it comes to her face. This way, her face looks a little less, her her neck looks a little bit less thick because her neck right now seems really really big for me. 
especially because we have that gesture going on. So I would thin out her neck just to make it a little bit more feminine, a little bit more mermaid-like. <clears throat> Maybe the water um, is uneven on both sides, and that's okay. So let me show you the neck before, after. It was a little bit bulky for her, for her size and for her form. Um, other areas that I need to focus on. So when it comes to the skin from underneath water, it is, of course, changed. So the, val the actual skin tone you use here is different from the skin tone you use to paint this. So what you have to do is desaturate it towards the green. So push towards the green and then move it to be lighter. And that's what you're going to be using for the high point <clears throat> of the, uh, I'm so sorry about my coughs, of the shoulders. Because the shoulders seem to be lacking a high point right now. So what we need to do is just give them that. They, so they feel like they're going to pop out. And that kind of creates a better sort of read for the form. The same color, I'm going to use it on the skin tone over here because we need to heighten the contrast. When a face is wet, the contrast is heightened. Her face looks really, really dry. So what I need to do is bring in really, really sudden changes. I'm going to throw in a shadow from here. The light seems to be coming from below. What I'm going to do is with Dodge Tool, I'm going to desaturate what Dodge Tool does though because it kind of messes up stuff. I'm going to illuminate like uh, the sharp, the sharp uh, wet points. <clears throat> so those points would be just sitting along anywhere where there is already some light. You just want to create a smaller margin of illumination. So it would be like an actual line, a pathway where the light is traveling along the water. And that would, that would happen everywhere on the face. So the face actually feels wet. Also the expression is a bit, um, is a bit outside of the, I guess the genre of what you're painting. It seems a little bit innocent, almost childish. And uh, I guess there's an audience for that. You just want to be careful not to mix expression with, you know, that it isn't really pointing towards the what, what it is you're doing. So basically, I'm saying that her expression is a little bit too innocent, in my opinion, for the amount of sexuality you have invested in the painting. So what I recommend, let me just fix these sculptures, I mean the, the sculpts here. What I recommend is giving her a little bit more mature of an expression, a little bit more mature of a face too. So maturing a face is very easy, you just have to define the bone structure, make it a little bit less of a chubby cheek. <clears throat> so what I would be doing here is I would just be pushing in the water and I would take away from that high eyebrow thing and keep that closer toward a kind of a come hither kind of expression. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of that. Beautiful job on the lips, by the way. I'm going to get rid of that um, smile. And also, you have a, you have an, a face structure. We've talked about the cute before. When you want to make something more mature, you got to shrink the eyes. Um, even in a female, she's still triangle. We're not escaping. It's not a matter of changing the triangle. We are still triangle. It's just the kind of triangle. Her eyes were way too childish. So shrinking them means there's more of a squint. There's more of a maturity that will match the level of sexuality you've, again, invested in the painting. Lower the eyebrows one more time. She's kind of like tempting the sailor to come in. So I would I would imagine she has less of a childish expression as he did before, which is like a yordle kind of expression from League. But now we have a little bit more of a maturity. Um, easy on the highlights, John. You don't want to throw highlights where there wouldn't be physically highlights. If, if her eyelids are capable of this level of highlight, it means that her nose is capable of like pure, pure white. So what we have to do is balance it. The nose has to be one of the lightest places on the face. So we have to bring everything back down. Now the way to bring in cheekbones is to just push the shadow of the cheek up a little bit. <clears throat> um, also, when a face is wet, 
the anything when anything is wet the edges are blurred so I'm going to blur the edges over here and then now I'm going to talk about color in a second I'm just going to talk about color all together so the orange you have so let's compare what we have now to what we had before this is before color changes so before after we've kind of brought the shoulders up a little bit we've brought some wetness to the face we've shrunk the eyes a little bit to match the maturity no um, 12 year old or 10 year old which is the kind of face you drew has boobs this size <laughs> I mean I've seen it happen but it's kind of like a freak accident <clears throat> so what we're gonna do is kind of we match the, the, the maturity level that kind of also separated there was a tangent created between the water and the edge of her face it kind of seemed like only her face was popping out it was too much of an edge so I kind of just fixed that there. Now it's going to be about color wash. I am going to choose one color that everything has to get filtered through. And I'm going to choose a blue-green because it's very friendly with water and anything sitting in water. So it's going to be a blue-green. I'm going to throw that over everything. I am usually mess with my uh, with my color modes. Let's see if I can get the filter there. So before, after. No, multiply does not do it for me. This is if I'm editing. If I'm choosing the pay, the, 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 the stuff straight off, um, I'm going to probably uh, choose colors that are already have, have been through a filter. Maybe something like this. Now this lightens. I don't like lighten that much. Screen. Maybe screen. No. Color dodge. No, no. If the um, if the layer modes don't do it for me, I usually just throw it on normal, and then and then darken after that. Usually the layers like to preserve the the contrast when they mess around. And you're a light. I don't want to uh, I don't want to lighten. So no, not linear light. Pin light. Maybe. No, it's not because it's not bringing down. Maybe I'll have to. I'll have to throw a separate layer on top. So I'll do soft light over the hair. Because the hair is pretty much what I want to talk about. The level of orange we have here is just not possible if the light isn't like just right in front of the sun. And it doesn't seem like considering how everything is set up that the sun is shining directly on her face I mean wouldn't her face be completely illuminated and, the, and there would be very very little cast shadows the cast shadows on her face are moving this way so I want to run everything through a common filter so the greens the, the oranges of her hair would move upward this way and it'd be more yellow so I'll get a new layer and just throw that yellow in. It would still read as orange, don't worry. It would still read as an orange hair, an orange head. But it would be a lot less um, separated from from the, the palette, from the environment. I'm going to throw that yellow in. It's just coloring the area underneath it because that's where her hair is sitting on the, on the image. And then I'm going to get a color layer again and kind of just unify the greens of the, the lily pads. They're too green. Again, it feels like they're they're shining, being shined on directly. Like it, it seems a very like uh, children's book green, very very primary. And try to explore the greens. There's all kinds of greens out there. And then this time I'm gonna get a pure blue green. No, it's not. That's garbage. Um, this way like a turquoise or something and I'm going to throw that over the water where the light is shining and that way the, the colors seem a little bit more controlled uh, flatten the image okay now about composition and framing I'm going to get another blue green but it's a little bit darker and I'm going to get on multiply and I'm just going to frame the canvas around her I want her to be the focal point, so I want to darken areas that are not important. You've already done a little bit of that on the on the lily, that's nice. But we still want to to do a little bit more. 
just to show her off. And then, of course, uh, it comes down to skin tone. I'm going to run a yellow over the skin tone, or a green, actually, the blue-green. Actually, it's going to be more green just to tackle that pink. Because, again, it kind of feels a little bit less natural when her skin is so pink beside all of that green around her. And being out of the water and being a mermaid or a girl swimming around. Not a mermaid, but just a girl. So I'm just throwing over the skin just that green tone. Less pink is needed. We've kind of unified the, 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 the palette this way. And then finally, the breast areas are probably going to be the focal point. So you want to lighten those up, but you don't want to lighten them up and saturate them. You want to lighten them up um, just on the mid-tones. They are paler as well. Breasts are paler in comparison to the rest of the body. There's way less, uh, so this, this color pretty much, there's way less pigmentation and redness there. And um, if you do, remember that hair shines in a very particular way. So if you do want to bring that orange back, you can't bring it back everywhere. You have to bring it back in a very specific spot, in a very specific way. Let me just throw in some detail for the hair. You have to choose the highlight for the hair. So let's say the highlight sits right across this way. So highlight for hair sits along a curve. And that curve is mostly desaturated. It's usually the color of the light source. The color of the light source is usually like a pale white. So you pale that out. It's not saturated. But around that, around that uh, color, we have the actual saturation happening. So I'm going to get the sponge tool, saturate, and I'm going to saturate that little illumination that I just threw. That's going to bring that color of her hair back. So this is what's going to carry the color of the hair. You don't have to have orange everywhere for it to read as orange. You just have to have it in the area the light really captures the color of the hair and reveals it. Everything else, though, has to be desaturated if you choose this method. Because you can't throw saturation everywhere. For this to be effective, you kind of have to preserve the light there. Um, also, I kind of just threw those uh, those little bits of the hair in roughly. I'll, I'll blend them now. That's not just in, uh, in shadow that the hair has detail. It's also in light, in light uh, strokes. I don't have time to detail the hair fully, but something like that. And I'm going to zoom out one more time, and everything is going to have like some level of glow to it. Actually, I have to throw a whole filter over the hair. One second. I still have to balance the hair a little bit. I'm just going to get a pure green, because that's the only way I'll tackle all of that. One color, low opacity. There we go. It's still an orange. It's not reading as yellow. If you really want it to read as yellow, I'd have to throw all of that orange in there. Now it's yellow, or a little bit greenish. But it's still orange here, you see. It's just an orange that has gone through a filter. I'm throwing that orange around, I mean that, that green around everything else as well. I want her body to look like it's really submerged, or areas that are more submerged than others, so I'm going to fade off and blur the edge of her arm. Wouldn't be that visible. Also, it's a bit too wide. Her arm is a bit too wide in that way. <clears throat> so I'm just going to shrink that. Okay, and we're almost done. One last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to throw over like a glow. Maybe lighten will work. And I'm just going to choose a light source color. So there's a lot of reflectivity. Everything is shiny and reflective, right, John? Because everything's wet. So there's going to be some level of mirror or spec uh, specular light happening. So I'm going to do something very, very similar to this. It's just going to be like a fog of glow over everything. Not everything, of course, just the focal points. 
just like that. And again, what is the keyword for this when you think about stuff in the large brush mode? When everything is painted in with a large brush, what does that <clears throat> what does that mean? What, what what am I what am I talking about when that happens? I mentioned it earlier. <clears throat> Anyone? Come on, people, grow up. It's just boobs. <laughs> Atmosphere. Thank you, Pecontreras. Treras. Pecontreras. The atmosphere, exactly. And then finally, if you do color her nipples any color, they have to be the color of her complexion. So this is going to be like an acidic pink color. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw one last little color correction, which is the, the color of her, of her lips and her nose and the just general blush on her face, which is going to be closer towards an acidic pink. Now I can throw it in there knowing that I won't interrupt the, the, uh, the, um, the palette. Her ears are going to get a little bit pink as well. And I'm going to get that orange off her ears because I only just noticed the ears. I'm going to get more of a pale skin tone and then throw that pink over it again. I don't want it to be orange. I want to separate that from the hair. Flatten. Only on the highest points of her ears are we getting some illumination. Because they're also wet. Color back to that acidic pink. All the way down. Just throwing it over the ears just gently. And then on her waterline, there's going to be some of that red as well. It's going to bring that realism back. What? No. After. We'll play. <clears throat> okay, a little bit of that red again, just under the eyes. And just along the saturation line of her lips, she's going to get a little bit more red just near the bottom. Not all over the lip. Just like this. So, <clears throat> any questions? So we can see the before and after. Let's see what Poof Kaboom is saying. See, I would have wrote an essay there. What? <laughs> um, is anyone asking any questions, or is this all just commentary? <laughs> Found a brush pack of Shia LaBeouf on DIY. I should paint a face with that. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I hope to see a 14-day challenge critique next week. Oh, if I have time, I will. If not, then I won't. No problem. <clears throat> What's my cat's name? Ossi, O-S-S-I. What does acidic mean when describing a color? Oh, that's some of that's kind of a little quirk of mine, I guess. Um, I'm going to say twerk. Um, it's just, it means that I'm thinking about uh, citrus colors. Hey! Citrus colors are like uh, really, really um, uh, acidic colors. That's basically what I mean. So I'm, when I say very particular kind of pink that I'm talking about, so when I say acidic purple or acidic pink, mostly I'm talking about acidic pinks. It's like the blood fruit, you know, the blood orange color, or a grapefruit, or colors you find in fruits. Those kinds of colors, when they happen on a face, it's just a very particular kind of pink. It's very far away from orange. When I say acidic anything, it's very far away from warm and really, really close to cool. That's what I mean. There's no such thing as an acidic orange, really, um, even though there are oranges that are acidic. Um, but what I mean is, color-wise, it needs to be a color that's really close to purple. Okay? Citric, yeah. <clears throat> um, so let's look at the before and after. Alright, so this is what it is when you guys think about atmosphere. Alright, before. Do you see those oranges, John? They didn't fit with the palette. You chose an, an, a common orange. You chose a common green. 
You didn't choose colors that came from a filter. The face was very, very young and very immature. But comparing it side by side with this level of sexuality, of course you need to think about um, you know, the maturity level of the character. And then after, we have a filter through which all the colors have been attained, and a glow, and a more mature, more pertaining to the sexuality expression. And uh, yeah, I can resaturate the, the frog, don't worry guys. Beautiful job on the koi, by the way. They're very nice. I'm sorry, I just burped. Um, uh, what else? Uh, there's the, 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 the colors of the skin tone are matching the color of the hair. Before it felt like the skin and the hair were, that's like a wig. It didn't really feel like it matched the skin tone. And then after. Um, I kind of, before the water was really making an outline of her face. Um, and I got rid of that basic smile and it kind of gave her a less detectable smile. She's still smiling, but it's very, very, uh, um, the Da Vincian, I guess I can call it. It's a very delicate smile, not direct. And let me just uh, run that through. Sharpen, unsharp mask, so we can get those details back. Does anyone have any questions? Um, Brian says, the atmosphere change on this and the last painting really brought out the emotions in the painting. Wow. Yeah, emotions is usually synonymous for, for viewers with atmosphere. How it feels when you look at this, you know, very uh, surreal, very fantastical. And um, that, that's definitely something you want to be able to control in your viewer's reaction. Um, can you show us some acidic colors on the palette? Um, well, there's this one. So usually... When you want to warm up a red, you don't go, I mean, when you want to cool down or a red, you don't go to, you don't slide up through, the, through all the colors towards blue, you go down towards the red and then scroll back down. So this is an acidic pink. Um, this is an acidic purple. Um, this is kind of what I mean when I say acidic blue. Let me find it right here. It's usually the cooler colors, and that's pretty much it. I don't have any acidity like in my language or my color vocabulary, me particularly, when it comes to greens and oranges. I usually just say warm or, or uh, skin tone or, or, or blood filled or bloody. But mostly the acidic is these gorgeous colors right over here. It's just delicious colors. Hubba da hubba da. I'm sorry, I'm just like admiring them. <laughs> <clears throat> So remember, remember, John, everyone who's listening right now, increase your color vocabulary. Don't just, when I say green, don't just see green, you know, don't just see green. See, see variations of green, see blue green, see a, see a more orange green, see different kinds of green um, when I say green. So that means you're increasing your color vocabulary. You are more aware of the multitude of colors and because you've used them in particular stages in your painting and you've come very acquainted and have an intimate love for that for, for that kind of color. For me, it's the purples and pinks like you just witnessed. <laughs> um, I really love the way they feel, especially when they're, you know, you have such a wide variety of, of analogous colors that come out of the cold, cold side of the, um, of the color palette. I, I, I deviate more towards the cold than the warm um, in my painting style. So that's me particularly, but uh, increase your color vocabulary, everyone. Okay? How do you do that? How do you increase your color vocabulary? Explore colors. Paint more with colors. But you cannot paint with colors unless you have a sort of awareness of the grayscale that, that is in colors. Um, you can't figure anything out about colors if you haven't spent enough time with, with contrast. <clears throat> nice bl black Oreo cookie. That's a really good. That's a really good observation. Today I was on the bus. He says, "No, looking outside and I saw the grass more yellow in the sunlight and more blue in the shadow." That's what you're responsible for, a black Oreo cookie. That's what you do when you sit down and paint. That's when you get the yellow and mix it with the green. You don't just get lighter green and mix it with white. You bring a yellow instead because that's the color of the sunlight. Yes, Impressionists, uh, the whole thing with Impressionism is that they were trying to capture light and how it affects color. That They weren't trying to capture edges, they weren't trying to capture detail, they weren't trying to capture subsurface scattering, particularly anything, anything like that. They, all they wanted was the color and the emotion through the color and uh, the, the light movement on color. That's what really separated Impressionists. <clears throat> 
how do you introduce atmosphere if you use grayscale? Atmosphere usually happens when you're combining different colors together. So what happens, how it translates in grayscale, is if you throw a haze or a hue. Um, also, if you have very similar grays together, so if you want to create an atmosphere um, in painting, in grayscale, you have to make sure your jumps between this and this, you're not making these kinds of jumps. All right, you're making these kinds of delicate movements over any one particular object. I'm not saying paint without without contrast. I'm saying distribute contrast according to the areas of interest. If you want to create a fog, the reason why this has more 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 um, it has more atmosphere has more atmosphere is because I threw that last little bit of highlight over her face and over her body that glowed. Also, I combined all of the values, so there's less contrast um, between the, the lily pad and the dark of the lily pad. So there's less contrast there. But also, um, it's a matter of making sure all the colors, all the values that are under the colors are all at a similar, similar temperature. So that's another way that grayscale also um, has uh, atmosphere applicable to it as well. Any other questions before I, before I call it a day? Actually, no, I'm just going to send this back to you with those layers. Any other questions? Um, okay, I guess none. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.